Welcome again to Reviews from Purgatory with J. Matt Weigand. This time around, Halloween. Probably the greatest slasher flick ever made, and um, it's a classic that still holds up. So let's talk about it. The basic story here is that in Haddonfield, a town in Illinois, uh, at the age of six years old, Michael Myers murdered his sister, his teenage sister, on Halloween night. And he's been locked up in an insane asylum for 15 years. And he broke out. And now his doctor, Sam Loomis, believes that Mike Myers has arrived in Haddonfield again. And he will reap havoc on this Halloween night 15 years later in 1978. And, of course, you know, that's exactly what is going to happen. And that's kind of it in a nutshell. Simple, but it's a good story. Donald Pleasance is great in this movie. He's a well-known character actor who has a long, long IMDb page. Probably two of the most memorable things would be him as S.E.N. in THX 1138 and Blythe the Forger in The Great Escape. Here as Dr. Loomis, you really see how he has this obsession with his patient, Michael Myers, and he helps paint Michael Myers as a certain kind of evil. I mean, there are pieces like this here. Seems to me you're just plain scared. Yes, yeah, I, I am. Uh, I met him. Fifteen years ago, I, I was told there was nothing left. No reason, no uh, conscience, no understanding, and even the most rudimentary sense of life or death, of, of good or evil, right or wrong. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. I spent eight years trying to reach him, and then another seven trying to keep him locked up because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. Definitely an impressive job by Mr. Pleasance. One of his most iconic roles, to be honest. Now, the other key figure here is, of course, Jamie Lee Curtis. Uh, this is one of her first roles, and she played it very well. And it was clear she had some star power and went on to have quite a career. As her character, Lori Stroud, she shows a great deal of courage and as well as innocence. And she becomes a great heroine for you to root for in this movie, which certainly helps. The rest of the cast, uh, they're pretty good. Like um, Nancy Loomis here as Annie Brackett. And that, that's kind of a key point here, because the rest of the cast is good enough that their characters become real, they're memorable, you're, you're sad when they're killed, they're not just hollow, empty cardboard cutouts that get stabbed to death, like in Friday the 13th. As such, you actually remember their character names, and you feel genuine horror at their deaths, it's not just meaningless killing, meaningless violence. Now, another key point here with that is that Carpenter spends an hour, it's almost an hour before things really start happening with Michael Myers and as such that means for an hour he creates these characters and builds them up before the bad stuff starts happening to them. As such, they're actually real people. They have some depth. It gives the story more meaning. It makes the fear actually more palpable too. Imitators of this movie failed to understand that you needed to actually build things up and that you needed to create characters that you sympathized with. Otherwise, they didn't mean anything when they were killed, which also reduced the fear involved too. If you sympathize with them, you fear for them. Alright, um, so I wanted to move into some more technical aspects. Um, 
I'm a big fan of John Carpenter. He's probably one of the best horror movie directors. And he co-wrote this with Deborah Hill. And you can see here, this is the point of view sequence at the beginning of Halloween. And I bring it up because the point of view sequence here is meant to conceal that the identity of the Watcher. Same as done in Friday the 13th. And that spans the whole movie because they were veiling who the killer was the whole movie, which was kind of too much at that point. It was overdone. And here it worked because it's just to, to conceal an early reveal of who who is watching this. That's the purpose of a point of view shot. And the rest of the movie is not point of view shots in Halloween. So you use a point of view shot to conceal the identity of the watcher, but it doesn't build fear all that well. Um, it kind of puts you in the head of the killer rather than on the side of the victims, and that's where you want to be. So it's better to have like the killer slipping up behind the victim, and you see the victim, you see the killer, and it's like you want to warn them. That works better. You're toying with the audience as well as the victim, as, as well as the killer is toying with the victim. It's, it's a double level thing. Oh, and while we're here, just, I just want to put up this thing that made me laugh here, because he was looking through the window, he saw his sister and her boyfriend on the couch, and then they went upstairs, and then he went around the house and got a knife. It's been less than two minutes, and now he's coming back downstairs? Someone has some performance issues, eh? Now here are some of the things that Carpenter does to create fear in this movie. I don't want to show you sequences that demonstrate them because I just don't want to spoil any part of this great, great movie. But I do want to describe them. One of those things is that you show the audience something that the character doesn't. They have their back turned when the killer gets back up. They don't see it, but the audience sees it. And the, the shot is to toy with the audience. This is another one. If you're trapped, you have a character trapped, and the killer is closing in, maybe they're breaking through a door, they're slowly coming at you, and either the character escapes at the last moment, just barely opening the door at the last second and getting away, or they don't. And you never know whether they'll get away or not. So, next one is not knowing where the killer is. This is part of why you don't do POV shots. That shows where the killer is. It shows they're slipping up on their victim. It's better if they're unknown. That way the characters are thinking, and the audience for that matter, are thinking, well, are they in the house already? Are they still outside? Not knowing where the killer is exactly, the unknown, even on this level, is really freaky. It works well. Subtlety is important in horror movies, and a little subtle hint can often unnerve you more than something bigger, something more obvious. You know, you, you come into a room and the back door is open, or the window is wide open, the curtains flapping in the breeze. So this one's kind of obvious. It's like how the bomb always stops at one second, not ten minutes. You wait to the very last moment for the character to either escape or be killed. There's a shot that they could get away at the last minute and maybe be killed later or something, but you, you let the killer close in, get closer and closer, and that ratchets up the tension. Obviously you use darkness. You want to film most of the horror sequences at night and you have dimly lit sets in the houses, houses and stuff are usually brighter lit than in horror movies, but you make it dark because the darkness helps. People pretend they're not afraid of the dark, but everyone is to some degree still afraid of the dark. You don't go to a bad part of town in the dead of night, and horror movies know that. So you use that detail, and you have the killer materialize out of the shadows. Then we have slowing it all down. If you'll notice in really good horror films, First of all, the whole story is slow. It takes a long time to build up. Everything's stretched out. It doesn't all happen abruptly. 
But more than that is that the killer doesn't run very often. The killer doesn't catch up almost immediately. You stretch out moments where a character's in jeopardy. You've got the time the killer is taking to catch up with them. You've got the character trying to escape it and you take it all slow. You stretch out any moment where there's jeopardy and it makes it that much scarier because you've drawn out the length of time you experience the fear. It's a good way to make it scarier. What we come to finally is the unknown. Something Carpenter excels at using in his movies to terrify people. Now, psychologists always say stuff about how what people are really afraid of is the unknown, but when you talk about it like that, it sounds really lame. And besides, that doesn't really explain it that well. To be fair, what it really is, is there's an unknown something out there in the dark. It was that noise we heard late at night or whatever. And we, of course, assume that it's someone who's just broken in or something. We are conjuring whatever that unknown noise is into exactly what our fear says it might be. So it's immediately not an unknown. It's our worst fear. The unknown becomes exactly whatever it is we're fearing. Now Carpenter's the master of using the unknown to terrify people. You never show the killer very clearly. They're in the shadows. They're not quite in frame. You see their arm reach for a window or something. It's not very clear. It's not obvious. And maybe someone's obscured by fog or you don't know what the entity you're dealing with is. But these are the tools that he uses. And he makes you terrified of the unknown. It's one of the best things in any horror movie. And Carpenter is one of the best at it. So I've prattled on a long time with just freaking orange lettering on black backgrounds about these ways to induce fear, but I enjoyed it and I hope you enjoyed it because I just wanted to point out the kind of things that Carpenter uses and why they work and maybe people can pick up something from that or just at the very least realize when they're watching a horror film why it isn't scaring them or why it is. You know, just, you go, yeah, this is good. And I, they did that shot right, yeah. And Halloween is a great, great horror movie because of these sorts of things. And you should definitely see it. It's a classic that holds up 1978, but it holds its own with movies of today. Classics sometimes remain classics. All right, on to the ratings. I gave this one uh, three on the blood and gore scale. I, I'm clearly not cape taking these things very seriously, am I? Because I keep giving them threes or something. They're all very similar. I'll look into that. Though obviously I should say that there is very little blood in Halloween. It's almost bloodless. Obviously given that I spent seven minutes describing how it was scary and what kind of tricks it uses to do that, um, yeah, it's scary. It works well. It's very high on the fear scale. It's the kind of movie to check out. You know, it, it's a great movie overall. I mean, maybe the soundtrack's a little irritating at times, and some of the acting's not always top-notch, but overall it's very good. You've got strong performances by Donald Pleasance and Jamie Lee Curtis. Um, most of the other actors are good most of the time. The story's strong. Uh, the shots are impressive. And... Um, very good given how little money they had to make this film back in the day. And when you get to the ending, of course the cliffhanger ending really helps this thing too. It's a great movie. Check it out. It's a solid eight and um, until next time, this has been J. Matt Weigand with reviews from Purgatory.
you folks have a nice day.